So I might now invite up uh, Andrew Burke. Now, Andrew is a uh, infectious diseases physician and thoracic physician at Prince Charles Hospital. He is widely recognised as, well, I think Australia's leader <laughs> in um, antimycobacterial PKPD and dosing. Excuse me, I'll go back to this. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to invite him to present on a topic which forms a very strong part of his research as a PhD. So, Andrew, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jason. Thanks for the chance to speak. And thanks for the uh, great talks which have really laid the groundwork for my talk. So um, this is a rough outline of my talk. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some case studies, about four or five real-world case, case studies to really go through microbacterial TDM, which is something we've only been doing really for about 18 months um, since we've had the assays available. And I think they've all been good teaching points. Some of them are a bit messy, and I guess that's real world. Like, how do they actually change our practice, if at all? So I guess one of, my, one of my goals is to get people thinking about the opportunities for TDM and microbacterial disease. And Hafiz said that in any fungal um, uh, treatment, that it's sort of a, a, young, a young and sort of emerging uh, process. And I think that's certainly the case for microbacterial infection as well. I'm really keen to try and get some of the pharmacists interested in this because I really think in microbacterial disease, uh, our clinical pharmacists have a, a huge amount to offer and are often very interested in both TB, drug resistant TB and non tuberculous microbacteria. So when we think about human microbacterial infections, so TB is a standout one. It's now, um, the, the, of all the pathogens, now that HIV is under better control, it's the one which kills more people than any, any other single pathogen, maybe coronavirus is hedged this year. Uh, leprosy is still an issue in some parts of the world, and many of the drugs that we're using uh, in non-tuberculous microbacteria have their origin in leprosy treatment. And in Australia, many higher-income countries, non-tuberculous microbacteria uh, really accounts for most of the microbacteria we treat. And we can... Divide, divide those up into slow growers, such as Mycobacterium avium intracellulare or MAC, and Mycobacterium abscessus. And even though we tend to think of these as being more prevalent in high income countries uh, compared to TB, which it may be the case, certainly in other parts of uh, the world, we were in Vietnam last year, our group uh, doing some talks, and these are really increasingly identified in, in low and, and middle income countries as a major clinical issue as well. So we're going to try and cover uh, all of these. So if you look at, say, fully susceptible TB, um, this really has very high cure rates. And this is, uh, in Australia, we have a 99% cure rate for fully susceptible TB, uh, which is certainly better than uh, low and middle income countries, where often it's around 70 to 80%. And so this is a lady we had who was uh, a young lady from Punjab who had obviously very destructive TB of her right lung. And look, she had a, a full recovery despite standard dosing. You know, she was quite malnourished. You would have thought if there was going to be a PK, PKPD mismatch, it would have been this lady. And yet she made a good recovery. Whereas this fellow is a patient I had from um, a patient of mine currently, he's, a, he's had microbacterium avium intracellular infection. So this is a non-tuberculous microbacteria. Again, he's got a, a, a right upper lobe, sorry, left upper lobe cavity and left lower lobe are seeding here. And he really had failure despite 12 months of treatment, including IV casing for three months. Um, and he proceeded to a left upper lobe lobectomy about a year ago. So this is really a case where antibiotics alone weren't going to result in a cure. So we have a, uh, a disparity in some different microbacterial infections, but high cure rates versus uh, uh, very low cure rates in some, cities, some situations. Now, I realise there's a number of international, speaker, uh, international attendees here, but in, a, in Australia, we tend to use the WHO dosing, and this is the table that we tend to use, which is in our national therapeutic guidelines. And these doses uh, were really developed in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and this guy, Wallace Fox, I saw Sean, Sean Connery died recently, but he's really like, the Sean Connery of TB research. He, he led the British Medical Research Council studies um, in Hong Kong and in southern India. And these doses really were, were developed before PKPD was really thought of much about. And if we look at, say, rifampicin, um, uh, it was chosen, you know, certainly it was a, a bit of a game changer in TB, but it really, the dose that was chosen of 600 milligrams, that was really the, the, the cheapest dose they thought they could get away with. It was really a very expensive drug back then, and they were really selling quite close to the wind when they chose this dose. And the, 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 weight, the average weight of the patients in southern India when they did these studies was about 52 kilograms. So now nutrition was much more prevalent then, um, than it is now in India. And so now we're probably treating people with higher body weights. And even though we have high cure rates still in uh, pulmonary TB in 
say, TB meningitis, which has a very high mortality, 30%, 40%, um, that dose is probably uh, significantly lower than we would, than, we, than, we, than it should be. So this study was done in Indonesia, and they compared IV um, rifampicin to oral rifampicin. And if you just look at, say, the area under the curve, there's obviously a much higher area under the curve of the IV rifampicin. And this was also replicated in the uh, CSF. And this was also associated with a very profound mortality benefit of 50%. So there's a, a decreased mortality by 50% by giving an IV rifampicin for a few weeks versus oral rifampicin. So certainly the PKPD in this setting of TB meningitis um, was certainly uh, has been suboptimal for many decades. Um, in, our, in Australia, we've recently developed in, in Queensland, the Pathology Queensland, which is our major public hospital uh, chemical pathology department, uh, these, these assays which are now accredited and we um, offer these around Australia and New Zealand and we're now getting, um, even though we've only had them for about a year or so, we're getting uh, requests every week from around Australia and New Zealand about using them and so some of the case studies are really based upon our own experience and trying to interpret these and how they value add. So I guess for uh, people from other parts of the world who might be listening, uh, your ability to do TDM is very much dependent on whether these assays are available or not and how you would access them. They're probably not, but it's, we're the only laboratory which can currently uh, provide all of these. Um, and obviously a lot of these like ticocycline, nemopenem, have been developed for microbacterial research and TDM, but can obviously be used in, in other clinical syndromes where they're more frequently provided or prescribed. So one question is, can therapeutic dose monitoring improve TB outcomes? So I guess if so, which drugs should we measure? How do we measure them? Which patients do we test? Do we want to test every TB patient with TDM on everybody, I would suggest not. And really does it change management or outcomes? So possible candidates for, for TDM can include the most important drugs. So rifampicin and isoniazid, they're the most bactericidal drugs. So they're the key to having a, a highly potent regimen. And when you're resistant to rifampicin and isoniazid, we say that you have multi-drug resistant TB. And you've also got those drugs we use in multi-drug resistant TB, such as lenezolid, amicacin, levofloxacin, these are often off-label uses, although they now have a strong track record in MDRTB. They've often been developed for uh, other, other syndromes, gram-negative infections, other than TB, but they often have a narrow therapeutic window, and so these may, these may also be candidates for, for TDM. So I'm just going to start with a case. Uh, so in Queensland, we have a TB expert advisory group. We meet once a month to discuss all the MDRTB cases in Queensland, which are not many. Uh, so we can keep that fairly... Uh, tight rein on prescribing and discuss the cases. And we also have a microbacterial uh, multidisciplinary team meeting once a month, a separate meeting where we discuss other more difficult uh, uh, cases. So um, the clinicians have been uh, happy for me to share these cases with them for which we provided some input. So the first case is a case of pericardial drug resistant TB. He was a 21 year old male Papua New Guinea national who's uh, on a working visa to Australia. Uh, he presented to the Sunshine Coast Hospital in October last year with abdominal discomfort, uh, weight loss, uh, fevers. And he, um, he had evidence of a right ventricular failure. And on his x-ray, he had a very large pericardial effusion and he had evidence of pulmonary edema with bilateral, uh, bilateral effusions as well. And this is a CT scan that he had. And you can see here, he's got this very large uh, pericardial effusion around his heart. And he also had this, as I said, bilateral pleural effusions and he had is he had hepatomegaly in society, so he had signs of right ventricular failure. So very, very critically unwell man. And he had a, he had a pericardial tap, so he had a, a drain of that pericardial fluid, and this grew multi-drug resistant TB, but even within a, a week or so of that pericardial tamponade uh, or constriction being released, released, he had a very marked improvement. So even before TB drugs had a chance to work, just by decompressing his, his, his heart, if you like, um, he had a significant uh, improvement. So um, eventually after a couple of weeks, he, he came back with drug resistant TB, gene expert was positive for TB and positive for rifampicin resistance. And he was commenced on moxifloxacin and lenezolid. And um, I like this sort of case because a few things, one is that it's sort of marrying the TDM aspect with the molecular genetics and phenotypic testing. So he had what we might call some low level moxifloxacin resistance. So I guess, uh, although the UCAST recent updates that Catherine alluded to don't mention TB drugs is some of the same concepts of drug dependent dosing, okay? So susceptible of increasing dosing. So with moxifloxacin here, um, he had this uh, diurase inhibitor, so it can be picked up on line probe assays, so molecular testing. And this was uh, correlated with his phenotypic testing, suggesting that he needed a 
a higher dose of moxifloxacin. Now, when we did his, two, when they, we did his suggested doing some TDM, and his two-hour post level was 4.3, and generally we were aiming for between four and six, and an area on the curve of between 40 and 60. So he was at the lower limit of normal. Uh, and as a result of this, his moxifloxacin was, was increased from 600 to 800 milligrams daily. So these are, these are higher doses than we would use in non-microbacterial infection where 400 milligrams a day would be something we would use in, say, community acquired pneumonia if someone had a penicillin anaphylaxis. For lenezolid, keeping in mind he's going to be on lenezolid now for probably a year. Uh, and it's really, the safety data is really going in for four weeks. So we generally, in the first month or so, we might like an, uh, a level of less than eight. So his, uh, his level is high. Um, and so as a result of that, his lenezolid dosing was decreased from 600 milligrams twice daily to 600 milligrams daily. So in this situation, TDM, uh, sort of in, in conjunction with his other sort of susceptibility, molecular and phenotypic um, testing did result in a change of management in this fellow. And certainly we've had other MBRTB cases where we've decreased lenezolid based on TDM. And we would probably do that routinely now in our MBRTB cases as I would for other people in long-term when there's a for non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. So this is the only PK curve I'll show, which is just to show you what we sort of suspect and know from other, other speakers today that there's a lot of PK variation. So in moxifloxacin um, in, in TB patients, there's really about a nine-fold variation and malnutrition protein binding uh, will also impact on that. So some of the AUC MIC targets are, are taken from other gram-negative infections, but probably do seem to correlate with a lot of fiber models as around a target of greater than 100. And if you use a standard dosing of 400 milligrams uh, that we might use in, say, pneumonia, then about half of patients are going to be below target. So currently, current guidelines suggest if your MIC is greater than 0.25, or if you're having rifampicin uh, co-medication, rifampicin will decrease the dose of moxy, uh, keeping in mind that in MDRTB you're not going to be using rifampicin, but certainly uh, I think TBN would be, would be warranted uh, in that setting. But I would say for all MDRTB cases in Australia, I think it's, it's not unreasonable to do in moxifloxacin levels and have a think about uh, your, your dosing. This is a, a man from Cairns who uh, was treated last year. He had TB diagnosed in the context of HIV AIDS. It was a new diagnosis. Uh, he was an Australian born man. Um, he had fully susceptible TB uh, and he had a low CD4 count of 120. He had a bit of a complicated course. He had immune reconstitution syndrome, had steroids. So he's somebody who, we, we know that patients with HIV AIDS have lower lower absorption of TB drugs. So it might be um, a reasonable thing to do to do TDM, acknowledging though that in Australia we have high cure rates already, even without TDM. Nevertheless, in, in this fellow's case, he was still culture positive after three months. And I think in Australia we're a little bit spoiled because our patients seem to get better quite quickly because we tend to diagnose them earlier. They, uh, we have less HIV AIDS uh, co-infection. So he was really not thriving. The question was, well, should we be doing therapeutic drug monitoring for the rifampicin and isoniser that he's on? So levels were done, keep in mind, this is now three months into treatment, okay? Um, and his, so let me reduce that my slide there. So for his C-max target, we really want to level it around about eight of the two hours dosing is what's been suggested. And he was 11, so sort of at the lower limit, where anywhere between probably eight and, and, and 20 would be, would be okay. But when we went to the AUC, he was probably around about 80 to 90. So probably, um, again, you know, in standard dosing, he's probably okay. But at the end of the day, he's got a, a lowish level, albeit in the, the vague target area, target, target range. Um, but by the time these, the time the clinic, treating team had thought about this, had all of the tests, had thought about what to do about with the result, it actually turned the corner and it, it now become culture negative. So in this case, I think it was not unreasonable to do TDM. He's somebody who was at risk of malabsorption of drugs. He, he was somebody who was, who was quite sick. But if TDM was going to be done, it probably could have been done maybe earlier, maybe in the first month of treatment, not, not waiting for treatment failure before doing it. So in his case, maybe increasing your Fampson dose, maybe isoniser dosing may have been a, a reasonable thing to do. This is a, a lady who had mycotium avium in pyema. So this is now non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And I'm going, to go sh I'm going to show you some of the drugs that we use for these uh, infections in a moment. So she had this effusion there on the right side. This was an empyema, so like pus in the pleural space. And she was immunosuppressed. She had rheumatoid arthritis and, and was on the flunamide and methotrexate. So immuno, immunocompromised, immunosuppressed. And she was really quite cachectic. And um, she was on these drugs with Fampson, with Dambitol. Clithomycin was changed to azithromycin because of 
rifampicin and corithromycin uh, interactions. Rifampicin lowers the dose of corithromycin by about 90%, less so for zithromycin. And, she, and the, the question was asked, well, should we do TDM in this lady? Um, these are the drugs that we tend to use in non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, so, you know, fairly complicated drugs that we're using. Uh, Mycotumor abscesses, I'll show you a case in a moment, prolonged IV drugs in this setting. So she had rifampicin levels were done, they were low, 5.2, keeping in mind we really wanted TB at least above eight and preferably much higher. And for a thambitol, again, we're at the lower limit of normal now. By the time these levels came back, uh, she'd actually died, okay? So yes, it, um, she, you know, whether optimizing the dose was going to make any difference for this lady, she was really very, very unwell when she came in, probably not, but even so, it does highlight that in many of these complicated infections, we probably are at the very low limit of, of uh, the levels that we want to be at. And there's probably room for optimizing, optimizing the dose. So I guess for these real world cases, TDM was done. I think the, the, whether it's going to change management, we don't really know, but I think it's a reasonable thing to do for some of these very sick people who are on long-term treatment. This is another case here from Adelaide who was discussed with us. She had a, a, an infection I'd never heard of, Mycotium thermoresistible, very sort of exotic sounding name. Uh, and he had this sort of dilated esophagus here, what we call achalasia, so this chronic aspiration. He's only a, a young man who was in ICU for about two months. Okay, with this, he'd been a soccer coach for his local, you know, his kid's soccer team. Uh, and sadly, there's very severe infection. And he's come through it, but we suggested lamezolid and we used TDM in, in this case to try and get him over the line for that prolonged, um, prolonged course that he, that he did require. So I think for lamezolid dosing and TDM, I think there's probably uh, the best evidence for this. Um, you know, the dose of 600 BD that we use in other infections, non-microbacterial non infections, the good news about for TB is that we can probably lower that dose uh, to 600 daily or 300 milligrams daily in some settings. Um, the MIC ECOFs around about one or so for, for MDR-TB. And certainly there's hot in with the, the higher dosing, there's quite a high rate of bone marrow suppression neuropathy and optic neuropathy in sub-Saharan Africa when these studies have been done. And in some of the big MDR-TB trials, at least 70% of people had a, or was felt to be a lanezolid-related side effect requiring treatment interruption. So um, this is some uh, XDR-TB patients. So again, even the more advanced uh, drug resistance. And uh, those who had a, a trough level of greater than two uh, were, were had a high rate of toxicity. And you can see here the, the high rates here. So again, there's significant PK variation, as you might expect for the different dosing. But then again, there, was, there did seem to be a correlation between the trough levels and the, the rates of toxicity, which were quite, quite high. So in terms of um, uh, optimizing layers of dosing, so there's been quite a bit of uh, discussion around about this. So I think, you know, from my reading of the literature, in the first four weeks when maybe people are most sick, sick then aiming for a, a trough level of less than eight is probably a reasonable thing to do. And then moving beyond that, perhaps lowering the dose and aiming for a trough level of less than four seems to be something that can help us keep people in lanezolid for, for a much longer period. We've had patients with TDM have been able to be on lanezolid for up to, four, up to a year and beyond, and we've been able to manage their side effects of anemia and, and peripheral neuropathy by dose reducing uh, with the support of TDM. So this is just my last uh, clinical case. This is a case of mycobacterium abscessus. So mycobacterium abscessus, uh, Many of you have heard about it. It's a non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We see it quite a bit as a pulmonary infection in our cystic fibrosis patients, but also in our non-cystic fibrosis patients, people with bronchiectasis. And currently there's a, a, a form, an RCT called the FORMAT study, which is being run out of Queensland, but is going to involve hope for many countries around the world. And we're trying to work out the appropriate uh, length of IV treatment. Current, currently we're going to be randomizing between six and 12 weeks IV. And the, the drug cost uh, for uh, ticocycline and imipenem and amicacin is about $1,000 a day when you account for the hospital and the home cost. So the elastomeric infusers, the Baxter uh, infusers that we use, or the, the, uh, the um, custom-made infusers that other people would use in different hospitals. There's a very, a very expensive uh, regimen and the optimal uh, drug combinations are very unclear. But this is a case that was discussed at our MDT only last week. I was using, uh, in sad case in many ways, a 46-year-old man who had bipolar affective disorder and has a uh, autosomal dominant condition of hereditary osteochondromas. And um, his, he had a pick line infection. He was having a uh, vancomycin, prolonged vancomycin for a prosthetic joint infection. He's had a number of 
uh, a number of operations for this degenerative bone disease. He's got this prosthetic joint and he got a pick line infection and he's had a number of these over the years from environmental organisms. So his probably ability to, to manage a pick line in the community is quite limited. And he did mycobacterium abscessus bacteremia and this seeded to his prosthetic joint. And you can see here how his left hip has been dislocated. And if you look at his intact hip joint, he's actually got some osteomyelitis around the pelvic rim. Um, the posterior part of the hip joint has been destroyed by this infection and the surgeons were in there, it was all pussed out and uh, is really an unstable joint. And this, he's, he's really looking at having a hind quarter amputation if this infection can't be controlled. So that means he's probably gonna lose his, his limb at the level of the hip joint. Okay, and he's only 40, 46. So this is a very grave situation. And this is the, some of the drugs that he's on at the moment. So he's had, he had amputation for five weeks, but he had bad tinnitus. He had ticocycline, which he had pan pancreatitis after one week. And he's now in this, uh, this uh, combination, imipenem, zithromycin, and famicin, clofazamine, and bedaquin, and we'll discuss now MDT. And again here, this is looking at him from the posterior angle. You can sort of see he's had this sort of destruction here of the posterior part of his acetabulum and the back part of the hip joint compared to his, uh, his native joint. So the team decided to do some imipenem levels, and we discussed this in our meeting last Thursday. Imipenem is a fairly unstable drug, so when you, if you do uh, drugs, it's going to be put on ice and, and processed within several hours. So that it's a little bit out of uh, whack here. The first level they got was less than 0.9. They repeated that and they got less than 0.01, so below the limit of detection, they thought maybe it was incorrectly transported, but they repeated the next day and they had the same result. And if we look at his um, MIC breakdown of imipenem, he's got an MIC of 16. So which is probably standard. We often see MICs of 16 to 32 for these uh, microtumor abscesses. Now, if you look at imipen and TDM, um, and this is just a good case of how these cases allow us to learn about it and, and try and work out the best way of, of, of utilizing this sort of information. There's been a few studies of imipen and TDM in burns patients and critical care patients with sepsis. And they basically say that you should be aiming for a trough level of uh, above two um, or a trough level above the MIC. So, uh, and that's really based on, the trough level above two is really based on the, the, the uh, MIC 90s for the common gram negatives, which people are targeting in critical care and, and so forth. So, you know, their, their guidelines, which are devised for non-microbacterial infections. So there's a lot, of, a lot of caveats about that and you've got to be very conservative. But even if we use the same principles of you know, time above MIC, maximum exposure of B-lactams, clearly with this fellow getting BD dosing, uh, he's not going to be anywhere near at the MIC uh, with this sort of dose. Um, and, and the team are going, and this is the same dosing we often use because it's what the American Thoracic Society uh, guidelines suggest, the imipenem is a gram BD. If you look at the product information for severe infection, uh, the company suggests one gram QID, which makes more sense with maximum exposure. But I think in, in non-tuberculous microbacteria, we get a bit lazy and we're trying to... Um, we're trying to find something which the patients can tolerate given the nausea this often causes and the polypharmacy uh, issues and then managing things hospital in the home for up to 12 weeks. So I, I think for this fellow, based on this, we're probably going to switch into cofoxidin, which can be given as a 24-hour backstream infusion. Um, so, you know, in terms of doing the trough levels, has it helped? I think in this case, what, is, what, this tea, what these levels are doing for us, it's making us have conversations around dosing that we haven't really been doing. We've only had these assays for about 18 months. Um, and so I think it's really changing some of the narratives that we're having and making us think a bit harder about our basic principles of, of, of therapy for these really difficult uh, uh, treatments, uh, for which there's often very poor outcomes. So just in summary, um, I think that for fully susceptible TB patients with pulmonary TB, then I think TDM is generally not warranted unless there was an issue with say, uh, you really, you know, someone had some gut malabsorption issue or uh, you know, advanced HIV AIDS or they were hypoxic on the ventilator, then maybe um, TDM may have a role to play. Uh, but I don't think for routine care we necessarily need that. Um, for TB meningitis, uh, for complicated non-pulmonary TB, I think we need to increase the dose empirically in many cases, and TDM may have a role to play in that situation. But certainly I think for MDR TB and non-tuberculous microbacteria, where we're using drugs like lenezolid and moxifloxacin, where there are sort of are some clearer targets. So I think that certainly has a role to play. And I think just looking, looking forward, I think there are, you know, microbacterial infections lend themselves to possibilities for TDM, even if we don't have those PKPD targets that we might have for say, antifungal infection or some of the gram negatives. Um, you know, they're, they're on these drugs for 
a year and beyond. Um, the drugs are expensive and toxic, often with narrow windows. And it's, it's very likely that some of the low, low cure rates we're getting uh, because of this suboptimal PKPD, which is sort of embedded in the current treatment guidelines. So um, that's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. And um, thanks for your time. That's fantastic, Andrew. Thanks very much. Um, so we are running a little bit over time, uh, but uh, what my plan is, is that we will have just a, a 10 minute break and then we'll start the next session. Uh, next speaker will be Darren Roberts. There are a couple of um, questions here that I might just look at. Um, Lever Floxacin, would you consider it a narrow therapy index drug? Yeah, so I guess with Levo, it's probably less likely to be a narrow therapeutic index. So I guess, yeah, globally, levofloxacin is used more often in MDRTB uh, because it's cheaper and there's no drug interactions. I guess, you know, QT is something that's mentioned, although in the clinical trials, it hasn't really been unmasked as a, as a major clinical issue. In Australia, we don't have levofloxacin available on our ske national schedule, so we tend to use moxifloxacin, which has more drug interactions. And, um, and, uh, you know, is metabolized, uh, whereas levofloxacin is not metabolized. So I suppose uh, levo doesn't have so much a toxicity issue, but probably does have a PK variability. And certainly uh, we're doing some studies on that in levofloxacin in, in Vietnam, supporting a, a study which Susie may touch on uh, in future sessions. Thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, I do know there's uh, some questions from Kim Tarr and Michelle Cree about Hafiz's previous talk on Amphotericin therapeutic drug monitoring. And uh, the short answer to that is that there's no clinical pharmacodynamic data to support that. Uh, and, uh, there, but there is some preclinical data. So the, the jury is really out on whether or not there is any value for applying therapeutic drug monitoring for amphotericin. And that's not something whereby locally here in Queensland, we've seen that there's enough strength of, of data for us to, to follow through and, and um, answer that. So. Um, I'll, I'll conclude there.